Hello. All right. There we go. So you've missed the first bit, potentially. Um, okay, so that's my uh, correlation. And for the sake of accuracy, I'm going to do average focal as well. Okay, get rid of these two. And then I'm going to do the same for the Genelec. Okay, so here we go. Uh, correlation, just to check. Essentially, I won't be needing it much, but never mind. And I'm going to do a average as well. Name these things, average Genelec correlation. Genelec. Okay, so what can we say about these two? So, uh, focal is blue, Genelec is red. Okay, <coughs> which one do you like more? Ha ha. It's kind of obvious. Uh, the funny thing though, I've done this, I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, we might have the time to actually put them next to each other and audition them as well. Uh, the, the nice thing about these Genelecs, I've compared them uh, with pretty much all of the kind of mainstream small uh, studio monitors, a good A-B comparison, is that they don't sound like a box. So my go-to signal, one of them for comparing speakers, is a very uh, well-recorded uh, singing, solo singing because we have the best possible reference deeply entrenched into in our minds in terms of what how the what's the natural tone is it so you kind of close your eyes and can you imagine that there is a person in front of you that kind of thing really works well um, and i had to say that that only the little genelec did not sound like a box it was the nearest uh, think to kind of close my eyes and imagine a person in front of me and it kind of works kind of disappearance of the speaker however what we see here is an issue I think I'm gonna get rid of the correlations so we do see an issue here in the bass response which is funny uh, what we can also see though is that certain things are off the room okay so what happens if I take the difference between the two speakers. Okay? W what does it say, in essence, compared to me taking the average <laughs> of the two? Yeah? This is the average of the two speakers. This is the difference, so to speak, <coughs> correlation of the two speakers. What's your idea? So the average would show the room more. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we expect certain uh, bits uh, to be present on both measurements. And then in that way, showing the bits, you can see highlighted more. Yeah. Exactly. So if we randomize one of the variables, right, that's what we're doing. I mean, it's not a huge amount of random. We'd have to have many more speakers. But technically, if we randomize one of the variables, do a lot of measurement, then what we're getting is essentially rid of those variables. Okay. So if I was to randomize the speaker, randomize the microphone, randomize the position, right, as much as possible and then average a lot of measurements, then I would be getting increasingly closer to what the room is actually doing. Okay? So how would I then test an actual speaker? Same recipe, randomize all the other variables as much as possible. Many different rooms, many different microphones, many different positions, average all those measurements, and there we go. Okay, so we kind of discovered that there is a what is this? Where are we here? So that's 20, 30, 40, 45 hertz uh, room mode, which kind of makes sense. We have something going on at around 
300 hertz as well in terms of a peak. Okay, but how should I figure out whether I have an issue with the port? And it's not port wine. Mm -mm. It's already here in front of me. So actually what I'd have to look at is reverberation time. Okay, because the thing that will happen is that the speaker's inaccuracy will contribute to the estimation of the reverberation time. Okay, so if I look at uh, reverberation here. Okay, so I have a genelic reverberation and I have the focal reverberation. And it seems evident, although not hugely, right, that the genelic gives me, the red one gives me a longer reverberation time in the base frequencies. Okay. Uh, what's the difference here? Well, it's not huge. It's about zero point uh, zero two seconds. Okay, so it's not huge, but it is kind of obvious. And then we see that it kind of inverses there that the focal gives me more reverberation at two k. Okay, so actually what we're doing then is kind of seeing the, uh, the time response of the speaker. And this is something that we should also be able to identify in the waterfall plot. So Genelec, you see, it kind of rings on with this frequency quite dramatically. Okay, let's see if I can make this. Well, the thing is that the, that the, the decay times at low frequencies are inescapable. Okay, so it's really difficult to tame reverberation at low frequencies. Okay? And typically, I would consider that your, your target is to have a balanced reverberation time. Right? So that, that's why your, your standard, you know, kind of uh, preschool you know, room treatment, dampen everything, actually means making things worse because you cannot tackle the base as much with your initial attempts of putting duvets and carpets and whatnots on the wall. But you're really, really reducing the high frequency reverberation dramatically. Okay. Um, let's see if I can get this graph to look a bit better and a bit more informative. So, uh, Am I looking at this graph? This graph, yes. So let's take two seconds. And now you see it really obviously. All right, so, so the genelic there in the lows, it just rings on. <coughs> okay, so it's not accurate. The, the funny thing is that by now we are all used to uh, this boomy bass. And if I play you, because this is not even a proper sealed box, if I take, um, for example, actually I, I tried to get this from our dear, uh, my dear managers, but they didn't quite stretch the budget to 4K. But to get the, the Neumann, or the used to be KNH uh, 310s, which is a fully sealed box. Oh, it's like really high side, right? It's totally f amazing. It's like uh, my friend got them and he just played with some jazz record and it sounds so brilliant. It's, it's brilliant speakers. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what you will have if, if you have a proper sealed speaker box is that you miss the boom. You see, we are used to the boom. You get a really tight, accurate bass, but we don't really want it. That's the point. Why? Well, because we're used to the boom and we, we, it, it gives you the sense of excitement. I've, you know, I'm, I'm happy with AT30s. Personally, I, I love these speakers. I learned to love vocals as well. Yeah. It's like, you know, but that's the point. Every speaker is a bit of a window. And it's kind of changing color. It's kind of hazy. It is blurred. It, every speaker does things to the sound. 
And the thing to do is to learn your window. And once you know the window, you know what's behind it. So you don't watch the window, right? You always watch behind it. You, you watch through the window, so to speak. So that's possibly a good metaphor in terms of learning speakers, because what you have is people who, you know, they just spend uh, probably a few thousand hours with a certain setup and they just learn it, you know, through listening to reference material, through working with them, and they know how it has to sound. Funny thing, I mean, even to this day, although I don't, I, I was fascinated uh, 20 years ago with uh, closed uh, Sennheisers. You know, when you get the kind of the dancing headphone thing, when it really vibrates. And funny thing, even to this day, the, for me, the easiest, the quickest way to uh, balance the basses with the rest is just take one of these headphones on. And I know immediately what needs to be the level of the bass. You put me in front of uh, ATC's Genelex Focals, I'm like, mm, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. I'm kind of undecided for quite a bit. With closed back Sennheisers, I just know the amount of pump it needs to deliver in relation to the rest, and that's that's that. I guess though that headphones are like more uh, neutral in a sense, because speakers are very dependent on the room itself as well. So yeah, but that's that's the other thing because you really want to s hear how the music works in a room. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the thing. So you you can miss quite a lot if you're just on the headphones. Okay, uh, so the next thing up, shall we see, is there anything more uh, interesting that we can say about these things? Uh, we can try the harmonic distortion. Huh? What, what, was, like, what does the correlation point out? Well, it's kind of the difference the of things, of, what, of two like measurements, okay? So yeah, what we... Well, depends on what you're correlating. So what we did initially is we did correlation between two measurements, one straight after the other one with nothing changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that kind of showed us what is the base error of our measurement setup. Yeah? yeah and then what we did here is we looked at the correlation of two speakers. Mm -hmm. So essentially what we're seeing there is where are the biggest differences between two speakers? And we actually see there is, by the way, maybe the switch isn't in the right position here. Bass tilt, uh, ISS disable. Yeah, I'm afraid that, that this, this speaker is, has been bass roll off minus six dB. It's all switched on, guys. Well, then well, the, the filters are on. Uh, okay. That's why, Th that's why it looks really shit. But the thing is that if I put the filters on, then you can imagine the ringing will be even stronger. So it's probably even worse in terms of ringing and probably a bit better in frequency response. What is it, like low and filter? Well, it, it's, you know, it's this dip switch with a lot of settings. Yeah. So uh, I ISS, you guys know what the hell is ISS? Yeah. Treble tilt minus 2 dB is on, bass roll off minus 6 dB, 85 hertz is on, bass tilt minus 6 dB is on, bass... Uh, ah, okay, so it's minus 4. So I kind of have a minus 10 dB off. So all off should be the right setting. Shall, shall we do it justice? Yeah. yeah. Let's do it justice. And actually, Focal also has a certain set of uh, settings there. Somebody was probably I using this. They say it's intelligent signal sensing. <coughs> oh, great. Yeah. What a marketing. So is that Makes me feel stupid. Track the signal out input of the loudspeaker and detects this decrease in you. Ah, right. So it's kind of standby. Uh, yeah. And that's what they call intelligent, yeah? Okay, that's one. Two. Okay, so do the standard thing. It's actually really useful just to check that nothing went wrong because, 
you see that with the noise floor, things uh, can go berserk. Okay, so the correlation looks quite good. Here, let's take the average. I'm not interested in these anymore. Okay, and now, yep, it's looking better. Um, can you see that? Yeah, so uh, let me just make general like a different color. Measurement, shape, where the hell was the color? Graph, I think it's here. <coughs> Okay, so Genelec is orange, Focal is blue, so we still see that the reverberation time looks a bit the same, okay? But what you see there is that we still seem to get a flatter response from the Genelec. Okay, so the next thing we can look at, again, probably better in comparison than looking at absolute values, is the harmonic distortion. Okay, so here's the harmonic distortion of the two. So Genelec is orange. Okay, so we have slightly, and what we have then is, I believe, the second and the third harmonic. Okay, so uh, do you see a legend here? I wonder which one is which. So one of the dashed line is the second harmonic, the other one is the third harmonic. Well, of course it does. I mean, we're testing with the sine wave. So the sine wave is just like other frequencies, so why do you choose fundamental frequency? Well, the sine wave is your fundamental frequency, and then every system will generate harmonics. But uh, so what, what is the fundamental? If you do all the frequencies between 20 to 25... Well, you have a harmonic distortion per frequency. What does it mean? Well, it means that... At 100 hertz, the Genelec distorts more than the focal. At 70 hertz, focal distorts more than the Genelec. But isn't it uh, dependent on the fundamental frequency? Yeah, well, that's why it's a graph dependent on fundamental frequency. So what is the fundamental frequency? It's anything you read, uh -huh. which one you want. Right. Just well, then. Okay. Yeah. So uh, now we see certain things about the distortion here. So you see that the fact that we have a better bass response here goes together with more harmonic distortion there. Uh, it's actually, I mean, overall, <laughs> it seems quite, uh, quite a match, right? It doesn't seem like there is a huge difference. I mean, there's differences per frequency. Hello? There we go. Uh, so there seems to be differences in different frequency ranges, but the two lines kind of cross each other. You probably wouldn't be able to call a winner here in terms of uh, distortion. Okay. Um, anything else we can look at? Harmonic distortion percentage? Uh, Okay, so this is probably a better thing to look at because here we didn't have um, a relation to the level of the fundamental, right? So this harmonic distortion percentage should be a bit more informative. And actually here what we see is that Genelec does distort more in low frequencies, focal a bit more in the mids, and they're kind of even in the highs. Is that a good conclusion? Yeah, I guess so. Cool, anything else? Group delay that's a bit complex. Hopefully we can see the impulse response here as well. So you see that the Genelec has a longer impulse response like that, sort of. I mean, this seems like a reflection, but then there again, there's this 
yellow or, or greenish thing here. Uh, I, I believe so. I essentially what you have is that uh, you, uh, I mean, as soon as you capture the impulse response with the sweep, right, you get a, a kind of an FFT, you get a spectral representation of what's going on, and then if you do an inverse FFT of that, you would get the actual impulse response. So I actually really wonder, I thought some kind of X here is export FRD, here it is, export impulse response. So that should work. But it shouldn't sound very, you know, convincing, I would think. Um, okay, anything else which might be cool? I mean, with, with group delay, I mean, it's kind of useful. We can figure out the transient response of the things. And there you kind of see the issue with the port. That's probably your port frequency somewhere around 50 hertz, although that looks significantly lower. But what you see then is that actually the, the speakers, the drivers are well aligned. Okay, if you have issues, if this is not a flat graph, then you have a misalignment of uh, the high frequency and the low frequency <coughs> drivers. Would that be the case if you're yeah, yeah, something like that. Okay, energy decay, envelope time decay. Well, energy decay should also show us something, but it doesn't really kind of see it there. We could try to make this. Well, it doesn't really make a huge difference there. Harmonic distortion we've been through, step response, not as exciting, squared impulse response. We've seen the waterfall. Okay, and the rest should be a bit like that. Okay, so that's our little uh, speaker comparison. And now we will go into measuring the room, the clarity of the room. Okay? Wait, yep. Does measure, like, the demo version, like, wh wh what does it have? Like, like, does it have, like, what it has what we need, but what do we need that it has? Uh, I'm not, I don't know it by heart. I've looked at it once and uh, I figured that you can do the basic things and that's about it. So just look up the menu, look online, it tells you what it does, what it doesn't do. So we could do something with we need to with it as well? Yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the, the, the first task, I mean, if you like, we can talk about the assessment as well. Um, it's good to have it on video because the first one was gone. This one is still recording, looks like. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll talk you through the assignment after, after we do this one, all right? So what we're gonna do now then is we're gonna move the microphone around the room, okay? So we're gonna try to do this systemically, more or less, uh, in that uh, we want to have certain data about the extremes, okay, far back and such. We want to have certain averages, okay. We essentially want to help Luke get some cash to refurbish this room and make it a dubbing theater, okay. Um, don't tell anyone, everything we do won't really make a case why not, in terms of the usability of the room for lecturing? What's the, what's the thing here? Why is it actually perfectly suitable no matter what I measure? <coughs> Microphone. Okay, so, <laughs> I mean, evidently, we do want to convert this into a, uh, but all the intelligibility problems are solved really easily. Namely, just use the bloody microphone. Okay, so guys, uh, I'm gonna put this a little to the back. You might want to move out of the way. Yeah. Because I expect that we're gonna have to drive it quite loud to get, uh, get any measurement going oh my god 
That's horrible. Okay, you want to sit down just to avoid making noise? Okay, that was enough. Cool, so uh, you want to move the microphone to the middle, please? Yeah. Cool. Far right. And, and put it completely in the corner, please. I think the cable should stretch. Ah, it's fine, don't worry. Take your seats for landing. Take off. Okay, so we've got three in the back row. Let's do three in the middle row and three up front. Okay? So while you bring that around, I'll name these. So this is back left. Back mid, back right, and now we are uh, mid right. Okay, here we go. Okay, mid, please. You guys want to shut up, please? Okay, let's get the mid left then. Mid, mid. Sweet. And then the front row, please. How front? Well, just the frontest seat, yeah? We want, uh, we want the extremes. Okay, ready? Okay, and then the mid front, almost there. Cool, and the last one, please. So this is front, mid, and exciting, isn't it? <clears throat> okay, here we go. So who can tell me 
what are what is another reason why we cannot consider these uh, positions to tell us the actual frequency response of the room? Expect more people in the room. We expect more people. Yeah. Anything else? The thing that we didn't do is we didn't rotate the speaker. Is that an issue? And why? Hmm? Well, it's, it's, the reflections, isn't it? it's not the reflections. It is the... Changing the position of the speaker. The rotation. I mean, we could have changed the position of the speaker. But you can assume that the presenter is at the same position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of the spectral response, Yeah, exactly. So, because th these speakers are tuned to have a uh, flat on-axis response. So, the crucial term here is off-axis response, which is skewed for most of these speakers. And that's, in fact, another kind of measurement we could do in terms of uh, comparing the speakers looking at their off-axis response. Now, I didn't talk much about, just before we get to this, but actually, one of the tricks in terms of measuring speakers is to take a sufficiently large room and put the mic and the speaker really close to each other and the furthest away from any reflections. Okay? Because if you have, I kind of mentioned this in one of the lectures, I believe, so what you have then is a certain time window within which there will be no reflections. So actually, typically for mid and high frequencies, you can have a very accurate reading, right? Because you're looking just at the time window before the first reflection arrives, and that's your kind of clean, clean time. Um, okay, so let's see what the hell is going on here. Let's look at the average of it all. Okay, and let's look at uh, correlation of it all. Oh, it doesn't want to do more than a few things for correlation. Yeah, it takes only two for correlation. All right. So we can look at the average. And what we're doing here now, I'm going to get rid of most of the plots here just to keep things straightforward. We're looking at clarity. Okay. So, here are the values. Uh, the thing that we might expect then is if I take a front average. Okay, so I'm going to take the front average. That's this. And I take the back average. we should have a clear indication that front is much cleaner. Okay, so what we have then is blue is front, uh, red is back, or orange is back, and that's the crucial amount of clarity increasing towards the front, and this is C80. Okay, I'm not sure if we can get the C50 out of this. Let's just see. Yeah, we probably can. Here's the C50. Okay, so this one should be for speech. This is your speech clarity index. Um, cool, so what are the target values? I don't know these by heart. But it's something that you can look up for your assessment, and we can ask Luke to do the same thing. Okay, I can also do... Um, uh, actually, this graph is pretty neat already. Okay, now what I can do as well in terms of assessing the room as a whole is evidently look at reverberation times. Okay, now that I have the average across the room, I will probably have a fairly good estimate of what it is. 
and this is what it is. So we have quite a long reverberation in the bass frequencies. And this is actually very curious, this 2K. You see, that, that's kind of that, that uh, flutter going on, probably. But in any case, very disbalanced. Okay, total disbalance. So probably this ceiling is responsible for the dip in the mids. Okay, this is a kind of an absorbent ceiling. It's actually doing two things at the same time. So one thing, it's a bit porous, although I can't quite see it. So there should be like micro pores in the material. And the other thing is that these are loose plates or panels. Okay, so it also functions as a panel absorber. So it has its own resonant frequency and it therefore resonates with that frequency, converts to heat and movement because it's loose as well and therefore does not reflect it back as much. So that's probably this dip in the middle. Okay, uh, let's see, is there anything else quite cool that we can uh, consider here? Reverberation time definition. Okay, how is this looking? Average over the whole percentage, increasingly better in high frequencies, so on and so forth. And we can also probably look at the waterfall. But we've kind of looked at, at the reverberation times anyway. Uh, anyway, here is a waterfall. Okay, typically quite neat. Nice way of displaying it. More reverberation in the bass. Some kind of peaking. Where is this? Probably around 3K or so. Okay. All right, cool. Um, excellent. Any questions about this? Okay, so to actually do the thing and assess in terms of uh, usability, we'd be going to the literature and looking up the values, what are the target values for all these different parameters, and then you can get that done. All right? Cool. So to finish off then, uh, I will say a few things about the assessment. Is that desired? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, please. Okay, let's see. My privacy matters Pff, to the machines, surely. Uh, <coughs> okay, so here is our assessment brief. So um, what we have is in essence three tasks and you need to do two out of three. Okay, that's what we're doing. So first one is transmission properties between three adjacent spaces. Okay, so this uh, measurement will require an SPL meter, which you can borrow from uh, Lucas and Isaac. I have asked them to make sure that you guys can have gear over the holidays. I didn't have a response yet from them, so... Uh, yeah, well, you guys have to go there and, I mean, start booking anyway, because... Uh, yeah, but I said, for, if it's like for Christmas break, like yeah, um, yeah. they say it's closed, so it might be best. I asked for, like, long-term loans and external rules, and if you get it for two weeks, if it's for longer, it's three weeks, but if you don't need too many, you never know, I might be able to get it. How long is the break? It's like two or three, three weeks. Three weeks. I'm sure they will give it out. I mean, it's for assessment anyway. Right? But you have to be first to book it if you want it in that period. I believe we have six measurement but microphones. You can't, that's the thing. Huh? You can't book it for Christmas break. D did they say this no, specifically? Like the connector the system won't allow it. Yeah, yeah, but they can hack the system. It's not that. Right. Th they're still in charge of the system, luckily, other than rather than systems being in charge of us. We can speak to them. I just say, uh, from my experience, I don't know. It might make a little I did a push. Okay. So the next thing is for you to go there and say, okay, I want it over the Christmas. Mm -hmm. And if they say no, then I can do another push okay. because otherwise I'm doing two pushes. Okay, fair enough. Right? Push. I mean, a push is not an issue for me, to be honest. But, you know, it's best because you, if you want it over Christmas, go there today 
yeah. and say, guys, I want this over Christmas. Can you book it for me? If they say no, then I'm still here to uh, give you a hand. OK, so I believe we have four SPL meters and six measurement microphones. So it's not a huge number for 24 odd people. So what you can expect is that Christmas will be booked probably and uh, straight after Christmas will be booked. When are you back? First day we're back? It's uh, probably the... This one is 10th, I believe. So Tuesday is the 10th. Yeah. Are, are we open bef the week before that? Yeah. So on the 2nd of January, no? no. Probably not. Yeah. So, and on Friday, not even on Friday? Well, anyway, you have to figure it out. Um, in essence, you can do this already before Christmas, okay? Uh, in essence, you can do it with suboptimal gear as well, right? Depends what you're doing. But if you want a really neat submission, you know what to do. Okay, so the first thing is transmission properties between the rooms. Uh, in, in all cases, what I have is a few points to follow and many points that are not there for you. Okay, so at this level, I hope you don't expect to tick all the boxes and get the maximum possible, you know, evaluation for ticking boxes. So there are some boxes for you to tick if you feel anxious without boxes. But the, the point of assessment is to see whether you can progress in this direction. Um, typically, I am marking things relative to each other. Right, so I don't have an absolute, you know, value, a bit like measuring here. You know, so I typically get a kind of a Gaussian curve, normal distribution, and make sure that there are maybe 10% first class marks, and then the rest stretch. Uh, typically, if you submit anything, it, you are unlikely to fail. I mean, don't take this, <laughs> you know, too literally. Uh, but uh, it's, it's not a difficult thing to get a low mark on this assessment. It is a difficult thing to get a first class, okay? Um, so this, this first thing, shall I read through this generally? So SPL measurement, so you need a SPL meter, you need a speaker, and you need some noise going into the speaker. And you need three rooms where you are able to drive the speaker quite loud, okay? Because you put the speaker in one room, measure in other two rooms, put it in the second room, measure in two other rooms, put it in the third room, measure in two other rooms. Okay, so you get a kind of a matrix of data. Now, the thing that makes this uh, a challenge is that the question arises, where do I put the microphone within the room and where do I put the speaker within the room? What's your idea? <coughs> Yeah, middle, sure. Middle in both rooms. The thing is that you understand that the sound pressure level drops with distance. Okay? So what you're trying to do, in essence, is make sure that the distances are equal if you imagine the walls away, so to speak. Right? So what you would want then, if you have two walls to two rooms, you would want to place the speaker such that it's equidistant to the two walls, okay? So I'll leave you to kind of puzzle that geometry. Uh, what you can also do is you can do multiple measurements and take the average, okay? That's another hint what to do for a good mark, for a better mark. Take multiple measurements, slightly different positions, and take the average, okay? Those kind of techniques uh, work well. Okay, so the real interesting thing here is, uh, an another thing which is an advanced uh, suggestion is figure out what is your base error. Okay, so because, you know, if in the end you get like, okay, there is 2 dB difference, is this significant? That, that is the main question. So how do you figure out the base error? Well, you're kind of walking around with the SPL meter anyway. Uh, it's useful, by the way, to have it on a stand. You avoid contact noise and things like this. But you can kind of get an idea of how different the measurements are in different locations. And 
take multiple measurements and such to figure out what may be your error base. Okay, uh, cool. So what is really important is that your speaker emitting noise emits the noise at the same level. Okay, it's kind of difficult to mess up because you don't touch the knob pretty much, but it might be that you're reconnecting power, this and that, so make sure that's the case. If you want to be very neat, each time take an SPL meter at the same distance from the speaker and make sure that you're getting the level. Now, if I do this in one room and I do it in another room and I get a different reading, what could be the cause? Hmm? The, effect the, the effect of the room. So do I compensate for that or do I not compensate for that? No. But what am I measuring? Hmm? Well, I'm measuring the transmission to the other room. Okay? So technically I should compensate for that, right? Because if the SPL within a given room is what I'm measuring on the other side of the wall, I should make sure that the SPL in that room is the same. If it is a reverberant room, I need to drive it with less energy. If it is a dead room, I need to drive it with more energy. But what I'm after is the transmission of airborne sound through the wall. Okay? Uh, cool. Transmission loss given direction. So the interesting thing will be, does asymmetrical transmission happen? Okay? Could it be that the transmission from A and to B is different than B to A? Okay, so that's one of the things to look at. Uh, by the way, it is unlikely. But let's see what happens. Uh, producing and engaging in visual representation. Okay, diagrams, draw the rooms, draw the position of what you're doing. Thoroughly describe the setup, photographic evidence. Uh, produce the argument on the suitability of the given space for its sur purpose based on regulation and target values from the literature. Okay, so it depends where you are. You might not find, uh, you know, a target value for your toilet you know, acoustical quantities, but then you can consider that to be your alternative recording room, make something of it. Right, so with those like pre-adjacent rooms, we need to measure the transmission between A to B, B to C, C to A, like all, all the, the possible, room. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then you produce a document. Okay. Like it's going to be quite uh, challenging in 700 walls. It's, it's a squeeze, I agree. In fact, I'm... Uh, the funny thing is that it should read seven to eight hundred, to be honest, because it's fourteen to sixteen hundred. So I think I've made a mess there. I'm going to correct that to seven to eight hundred. Okay, so you do two out of so the total should be around fifteen hundred. Okay, cool. Second time, uh, huh? If it's like seven hundred for each of them, it's three of them. No, you do two out of three. Ah, okay, that's good. Yeah. So you can select which ones. Yeah. So task two, optimize speaker placement in a control room. So I guess most people will be choosing this because they have some speakers in the room. Uh, assess the range of feasible speaker positions in a room based on the given constraints. Okay, so the first thing to look at is where can I put them to start with? Okay, the kind of limitations that are imposed by the room. Then look at the distance from the back wall. Okay, so you've seen me uh, find a huge 200 hertz peak just like that, in not even measurable uh, or not even predictable based on the distance from the wall. I think it was like 40 centimeters and suddenly it sprang up like crazy. Happens, acoustics are more complex than our ability to predict stuff. Uh, so this is actually something that has to do with a lot of measurements, okay? Uh, 
just take different distances, look at the base response, look at what you get, what is the best thing. Also, you can play with the dip switches. Okay, so in essence, what you're doing is you're moving the speakers around and finding the best response that you can get. But you're looking at this from two perspectives. One is the back wall distance, okay, and the other one is the side wall distance. Because if you imagine the matrix and you try to put it in all possible locations, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get too many positions. So you look at one axis, you look at the other axis. So the crucial thing here is that from the back wall, you are typically looking at peaks in the lows. Okay? And from the side walls, you're typically looking at dips in kind of low mids. Okay? So that's what you're trying to correct for. But you will see. Okay, so it's, it's up to you. Maybe you won't be able to identify uh, a reliable dip moving so or a reliable peak wall? moving. Excuse me? What did you say about the side wall again? You're, you're watching f uh, the dips, the notches in kind of low mids. In the side wall? Yes. Right. And the back wall, you... You're looking at peaks in the lows. Right. I mean, technically, they will all produce both peaks yeah. and dips but it is more pronounced in that sense. And the, the ideal thing would be to be able to trace the peak moving based on the distance, but it might not happen. And the other ideal thing would be also to identify a notch moving based on the distance from the side walls. Yeah. And again, it is not very likely that you will get it a very clear because of the complexity of the room if you were in a dead room with single uh, reflector single speaker you would probably get a, a visible result so there have to have generators for that? no no you use your own speakers because that's the point that you're not calibrating you're not figuring out the position of any speaker in the room you're figuring out the position of your speaker in the room That's a great question. So the thing is that, yes, one monitor in both cases, for distance from the back wall, distance from the side wall, and then if you figure that out, th the thing to know is obviously that you want a symmetrical setup. Okay, so if you don't have a room where you can uh, set things up symmetrically, that has to go in the first point, and then you say, well, actually, it's bad to start with, but you know, we're going to make shift, make do. So we're kind of like taking into consideration, taking into a given that this is the room, this is... This is the room, these are the speakers. Yeah. Optimize the position. Yeah, and like the setup and the different like reflectors and like the different like... If you, have, if you have some diffusers, some uh, bass traps, sure, you can move those around as well. Mm -hmm. But typically what you would do is set up the speakers in the naked room, so yeah. to speak, and then introduce the things. Wow. Um, so if you want to go really advanced on this one, uh, what you might end up doing is finding two, maybe even three good distances, good positions based on measurement. So again, you do it with a single speaker, the back wall distance, the side wall distance. And then if you have two or three, the ultimate thing to do here is to compare them with audition. Okay, uh, the other thing which is uh, quite frequent is to move the microphone around the listening position a little bit. Okay, so that's another thing which is not specified, which is your advanced technique, is to, you know, take a, maybe a circle of your head, kind of add a bit of movement back and forth, maybe half a meter, maybe three, four points in that circle should be sufficient. Because otherwise you might be picking up things that are uh, kind of very position specific. What is that like? For example, like I live in a studio flat, right? And obviously you have the kitchen, like, and you have like a segment of the bedroom, right? So do I need to go and also like measure it from the kitchen? Then oh yeah, like no, kitchen. no, but it's it's a control room. Right. You're not gonna control your mix from the kitchen. Right. So I just like sweet spot. Right. Yeah. 
but a bit around the sweet spot because yeah. you've seen already how minute position changes make a huge difference. Okay? Cool, so you have this distance and then it also says height of the speaker. Okay, so this has to do with your desk surface. Okay? So it's, it's actually a really interesting thing because, you know, what you're actually doing is you have a suboptimal transducer which has its dips and peaks. And what you can actually do is you can, by positioning, dip where it peaks and peak where it dips. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is a really interesting thing to, to consider. Well, it depends if you, have the, if you have the stands that allow you to do it. If you don't, you know, do it once with three books, once with two books, right. you know, find a way to at least have one or two different measurement points. But again, this is all in the context of having assessed the range of feasible positions, the limitations of the room, of having stands or no stands, and all the rest of it, okay? But in any case, it's likely that the, that the height of the speaker will uh, give you the least to write about and to consider, but nevertheless, consider it. Okay? Yeah, but I can sit like this, I can sit like this. And I think, and that's another thing that you can, it's, it's a very good comment because that's another thing that you can go into. Because why is it the ear level thing? Um, the red flag. Yeah, because on axis, off axis response. Yeah? But you are measuring, right? So it might be that your speaker is too shrill anyway, and listening to it a bit off axis actually helps the response, right? The other thing is that if it's not the case, but you still want a certain distance from the desk, Maybe you can tilt them, because then you're getting the on-axis response, but at a different height. So there's just a huge amount of variables. Yeah. That's a lot of like poly cabs, you know, like for bedroom producers, for you know, they have the golden rules like they have to be like 45, like angle, you know, in a triangle and ear level. And yeah, yeah. Well, we don't deal with lateral reflections and envelopment and things like this. Towing in the speakers or other things, yeah. you know. This is more a measurement thing. Okay, so those are the three things and then verify whether this will actually give you a better audition. So what you can end up saying is, okay, I've done this painstaking procedure, I've got all this data, I put the speakers in the selected position, but it doesn't make a huge difference for me if they're like this or like that. Okay? So in the end, your audition should overrule because it's about the audition anyway. And maybe you're used to speakers in those stupid positions and you've learned that sound and that's why you relate to it. Okay? So there is some room for that as well. Okay, and then finally, task three. Specify the suitability of a larger space for music and lecturing. So that's the kind of thing that we've just done. Pick a suitably large space. Estimate room modes. Okay, so this is something we didn't do today. We did it earlier. Uh, so you look at the room dimensions. You do your little online room mode calculator and then you do some measurement and figure out whether you can trace those frequencies in the response. Pick suitable measurement arrangements to provide valuable estimations of average reverberation time and its spectral characteristic, something we've just done. Four different spectator positions in order to estimate the clarity and its variance across the audience. So we've looked at nine different spectator positions here, uh, we didn't look at the variance. We estimated the clarity, okay? We didn't look at the variance. So that's your task to figure out what that is. It's essentially the difference between extremes, pretty much. Okay, reflect on the suitability of measured parameters for supporting a variety of different events. Provide ample photographic evidence of the process. 
Is this room suitable for music? Not amazingly, no. I mean, you saw the disbalance in reverberation times. Mm -hmm. Huge reverberation in the lows. You would need a decent set of bass traps here. Yeah? And actually, the dipping in the mids is also questionable. How does the dipping in the mids work for speech? Not good. Why not? Yeah, but that's why I would claim the opposite. Because what is clarity? The gap. We've looked at the reverberation time, right? And we have a reverberation time dip in the mids. Mm -hmm. Right? So this means that the clarity in the mids should be higher. Make sense? That's why we actually have absorption on top, on the ceiling, which targets the mids to help speech. Can you re-say that? Repeat that? Yeah. So the reverberation time in the mids is very short, mm -hmm. which means that there is little late reverberant energy, which makes the clarity higher, right? because the clarity is the ratio of early reverberant energy to late reverberant energy. You reduce the late reverberant energy, you get higher clarity. Okay, so this space is actually tuned more or less for speech. Kind of expectable, expected. All right, well, that's that. I will correct the number, the word counts. Uh, maybe you should do that already. I'll upload the new version again. And then uh, that'll be it. All right. So I will see you guys at uh, one o'clock in, is it 52, I believe?